bit by a brown tip about 10 days before he wound up in the hospital. And on routine examination of the blood smear, uh, some of the laboratory workers noticed these clusters that look like bacteria inside of leukocytes, which are phagocytic cells that are meant to be opposed to defense cells and kill, and kill things. Uh, in fact, he got worse and eventually he exanguinated. He actually bled to death from what he developed it as an esophageal hemorrhage. Uh, we didn't know what this was at the time, but subsequently we proved this was a new tick-borne disease that had never been seen in humans before. But I can't take credit for this because this, in fact, was a zoonotic disease. That is, it's a disease that had been known to affect animals for quite a long time. So the veterinarians knew a lot more about this than any humans did. But because I work on this cusp of zoonotic and vector-borne disease in this world, it became evident to me this was something that was now beginning to occur in humans as well. And in fact, you can see, this is the bacteria that are living inside of a vacuole, inside of a neutrophil. This is actually from the spleen of the patient, uh, because he had to go, he died and he had an autopsy performed. In the next couple of years, uh, we identified 11 additional cases of this from Wisconsin and Minnesota, very contiguous areas in Upper Midwest, and began to report our findings. And this is the very first report, which is the Journal of Clinical Microbiology in 1994, even though the discovery was really made in 1990. Now, the second case is a little closer to home for us here in Malaysia, and this occurred in Guangdai County in Anhui province, China. And this was in October of 2006, where a 50-year-old woman who was previously healthy developed this sudden onset of high fever, severe headaches, dizziness, uh, some joint aches, fatigue, and her temperature, as I said, was, was quite high and maintained this. Sounds pretty similar to the other patient. Uh, she went to the hospital and actually began bleeding as well. She had a low urine output, and her physical examination showed that she was bleeding from her, uh, from her gums, and that she had a, a rash. Her white blood cell count was low. Her platelet count was very, very low. And they made a diagnosis at the time of epidemic hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome or with hantavirus infection, which is quite common in this part of China. Uh, a couple days later, within a day or so, she actually got much worse and was transferred to a, a larger regional hospital where she continued to bleed and then became rapidly dyspneic. She had a very difficult time breathing uh, and eventually died the next day in the morning. Let's go on. So, now, the reason these cases are going to be hooked together, I hope to talk about it as we go on, but by way of introduction, let me talk about the organisms that we are going to focus on today. These are rickettsia. They are in a class called rickettsiales in the taxonomic order there. Uh, and in the order rickettsiales, we have the family of rickettsiaceae, which we essentially draw, uh, uh, derive into two different genera, rickettsia and orientia, both of which contain organisms that can cause human disease. And a second family, which is called anaplasmataceae, which include several genera, the major of the major ones of these are Herolithia and Anaplasma, both of which contain organisms that can cause disease in humans. Now, these are bacteria, but they're what we call obligate intracellular bacteria. So they live like viruses and cytosols. You can't throw them on an agar plate like E. coli or Staphylococcus or anything like that. They can only grow inside of living cells. But they are true bacteria. We know this because they have typical genetic structure of bacteria, including uh, small subunit, sub ribosomal RNA genes, DNA, RNA, ribosomes. They divide by binary fission. They have a typical gram-negative type cell wall. But another important aspect of these organisms to be classified as rickettsia is that part of their life cycle is with an arthropod host, whether this is a tick, a flea, a louse, some other arthropod host. In previous times, organisms that were in the genus Bartonella and Coxiella were considered rickettsia, but they have actually genetically been shown to be quite different and have been removed from this order rickettsiales now. So this is the sort of the obligatory dendrogram, which actually shows the genetic structure of the rickettsiales with the Anaplasmataceae uh, family over here, Rickettsiaceae family over here, and selected members that are known to be pathogens of humans and animals and then the outgroups that we just talked about out here. And you can see E. coli's distance uh, relative to these organisms as an outgroup, just for comparison's sake. What, what I'm going to talk about today is this organism, Anaplasma phagostophum, and how it led to a number of different discoveries. I want to talk about first how these organisms 
cause disease. Now, organisms in the rickettsia genus infect endothelial cells, and they grow inside the cell, and they damage the endothelial cell. And as you know, the endothelial cell lines blood vessels. And when you get damage to the blood vessels, you get a process called vasculitis, or inflammation of the blood vessels. And when this happens, the blood vessels become leaky, and you can no longer keep fluid volume within them. And people develop low blood pressure, hypertension, and they don't perfuse their organs and tissues as well. And this is the underpinning, the major underpinning of disease with, with rickettsia organisms or those in the rickettsia genus. In contrast, the organisms that we're going to talk about today, ehrlichia anaplasma, have as their host cells leukocytes generally. These are cells that are generally associated with host events by phagocytosis and killing foreign invaders. In this case, these organisms take advantage of the fact that these are phagocytic cells by attaching to the, center, to the surface of the cell, and they actually become engulfed into a vacuole. And ordinarily, they would be killed, but they have mechanisms to avoid killing inside the cell. And they live and grow inside of this vacuole to form a small cluster that we call a morula. They damage these cells, they change the function of the cells, and they cause disease syndromes that are very much like those with rickettsia, but it doesn't happen in vascular endothelium. The reason the disease looks similar is because these cells produce, uh, produce proteins like chemokines and cytokines that actually cause increases in vascular permeability. So the disease process looks the same even if the pathogenesis is somewhat different. Now, these are perhaps not well-recorded diseases, and in fact, uh, they're now considered emerging diseases. This is actually a map of the reported cases of tick-borne rickettsial diseases, which include things like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Ehrlichia, anaplasma infections in the United States over the years. The first tick-borne infection ever recognized in humans was Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the United States. And since 1920, our public health service and then the Centers for Disease Control have been actually recording the numbers of cases. And you can see it's kind of waxed and waned over the years with a little peak around here. I like to say this is where I began to study rickettsial disease. And you can see after my after I started, it immediately dropped in incidence. Uh, but actually, later on, it's picked up dramatically so that we have more of these diseases in the United States than ever before. And this is also accompanied by a subsequent discovery and increase in new tick-borne diseases, Ehrlichia and anaplasma that we're talking about today. Now, are these really important diseases? This is a, a panel that I put together based upon data that comes out of our morbidity or mortality weekly reports, which is data that our Centers for Disease Control publishes on a regular basis. And so I simply selected 2009 and looked at a comparison of domestic infectious diseases that occur in the United States uh, that are life-threatening. And so here you can see some of these, this novel influenza A virus, tuberculosis, hepatitis A, B, and C lumped together, Legionella infections, and then if you simply take the wrong number of tick-borne rickettsial diseases, you can see it's actually a fair number, not well recognized in the United States. However, one of the things about tick-borne rickettsial diseases is they're very difficult to diagnose. And in fact, it's now recognized that they are underdiagnosed by at least a factor of five. So if you simply take this number and you multiply it by five, this is where the figure is. Now suddenly we're dealing with a class of organisms that causes a substantial amount of morbidity and mortality in the United States, and is largely unrecognized, certainly not funded at the level of these other infectious diseases in the United States. Notwithstanding all that, this is what's going on with the diseases that I'm studying right like now, ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. And you can see since the discovery back around this time of these diseases, there's been a linear increase in the numbers of diagnosed and reported cases as physicians become aware and as diagnostic, te diagnostic testing becomes more available to physicians that are thinking about these diseases. So we're at actually all-time high levels of these diseases now truly emerging in the United States. As I said before, these are small obligate intracellular bacteria that are related to rickettsia species, but they have a tropism to grow inside of phagocytic cells, chiefly those that come from the bone marrow of the hematopathic cells. And here in this transmission electron micrograph, you can see clusters of bacteria growing inside of vacuoles in these leukocytes. There are really two different forms of human ehrlichiosis that are important around the world, and chiefly in the United States, although there are a couple of others that are also emerging as we speak. The most important of these are human 
monocytic ehrlichiosis is called by the organism Ehrlichia chapiensis, gets its name monocytic ehrlichiosis because the bacteria grow in a vacuole inside of monocytes of blood, as opposed to human granulocytic anaplasmosis that we're talking about today, caused by anaplasmophagus complex. It gets its name because the organisms grow inside of cells that are called granulocytes, in this case, the neutrophil in the purple blood of the patients. There's a couple of other forms of ehrlichiosis that are known to affect humans. Ehrlichia canis, which is predominantly a canine pathogen of dogs. Ehrlichiosis ewini, which is caused by Ehrlichia ewini, also known as a canine pathogen, but also can occur in humans. And a couple others that, that only a few cases have been recognized around the world. Whether you're talking about either of these or any of the others, these are difficult diseases to diagnose because they're undifferentiated febrile illnesses. That is, people show up with a fever and not a lot more. So it can be very difficult to make a clinical diagnosis. Fortunately, there's some typical laboratory findings that when you test the patient's blood or other, other laboratory tests are done, these can help to make you think about these diseases and thereby treat specifically for them. Here's an example. With anaplasma and ehrlichia, most these people will have fever, headache, muscle aches. Not many have a skin rash. So most people that show up with only these signs would be sold. They have a virus infection or the influenza virus, and there's not much they can do to treat this to go home. But in fact, with these infections, they are treatable with antibiotics. So this is relatively nonspecific. However, the laboratory findings provide some additional clues so that most of these people will develop uh, leukocyte counts that don't go get <laughs> elevated. In fact, many of them are low leukocyte counts, and the platelet counts tend to be below normal as well. So a patient that has leukopenia, that is a low white cell count, and thrombocytopenia, a low platelet count, and a febrile illness during the time in the summer when ticks are active, uh, might be thought to have this disease. Another feature that's quite common is some evidence of hepatic injury, the liver injury. These two enzymes, alanine transaminase and aspartate, aspartate transaminase, are present in high quantities in hepatocytes. And when there's inflammation, some of these are released from hepatocytes as they die, and they will show up detected in the, in the serum, and this is another feature of these diseases. In the United States, we now know a lot more about these diseases. Uh, we know that about half these people, when they become sick, need to be hospitalized, so this is a relatively severe infection, and that anywhere from a half of a percent up to two percent of these patients will die of their infection. There are life-threatening complications that can occur, including adult respiratory distress syndrome, acute respiratory distress syndrome, disseminating intravascular coagulation, meningitis and or meningoencephalitis, renal failure, and other things that can occur in some of these patients as well. So the spectrum of disease here is very, very broad, from almost no disease, a mild febrile disease, to one that can kill you. The disease is caused by an organism that's transmitted by ticks. What we know about this from the studies in the United States and in Europe, and a little bit now from Asia, is that there's an increased risk as age gets up, as age advances, and in males, probably because of occupational exposures to ticks. Uh, we know that it occurs predominantly in specific geographic locations in the United States, in Northern California, Europe, and in eastern parts of Asia, and that the predominant ticks responsible for transmitting these organisms are those in the genus Zoides, and typically, these are the nymphal stage ticks, which are the immature stage of tick that will bite a person. And thereby, it's the small ticks that can cause this. Sometimes the adult stages are also associated with this. And the normal reservoir for these organisms and the normal host for these ticks are small mammals like field mice, cervids like deer, or ruminants like cattle, goats, and sheep. Here's the three major species around the world that are known to transmit the organism, Exodes scapularis in the United States, Exodes racinus in Europe, and Exodes persicatus in Asia. How does one make a diagnosis of human granulocytic anaplasmosis if you're thinking about this? The patient has leukopenia, bronchocytopenia, some evidence of hepatic injury. During the summer month, they may or may not have had a history of a tick bite, and they have a fever uh, and otherwise non specific findings. Well, you can simply look at the blood smear because about 25 to 75 percent of these people will have the organism seen inside the leukocytes of the blood smear. But 25 percent isn't high sensitivity. 
So one can do a diagnostic test by looking for the DNA of the organism in the acute phase blood. And this is very sensitive. Probably 90 95% were in the acute phase of infection. And once this patient is treated or is recovered, the DNA no longer persists in these individuals. Unfortunately, these tests, this particular test, is not widely available currently in the United States. So most physicians will elect to use a test called serology, where we look for antibodies against the organism, typically looking in the acute phase where they will not be present, and asking, are antibodies present after several weeks when the patient is convalescent? And if you see an increase in antibody during that period of time, that is a diagnostic uh, clue that tells you that likely the infection was followed by antiplasmatic stoppum and the patient had given granules of antiplasmosis. Once a diagnosis is suspected or made, it's actually very easy to treat because these organisms respond to doxycycline and tetracycline antibiotics. There's very good clinical efficacy data on this. There's very good in vitro activity, but there are no clinical trials to prove efficacy. In pregnant women, where doxycycline and tetracycline are contraindicated, rifampin may be an alternative. There's scant empirical data for this, but there's good in vitro activity, so it may be useful under these circumstances. Another class of drugs called fluoroquinolones are probably not useful. Okay, let's talk about these diseases and why I'm here to tell you a little bit about the research on this. Where do they occur? Well, they occur all around the world. Okay, they were first discovered in the United States, but it wasn't long before anaphylaxis was also known to occur in Europe, or Ehrlichia was found in South America or in Africa. And then anaplasma and human granulistic anaplasmosis found in parts of Asia. So here's the story on this. I had some Korean postdocs working in my lab at this at time in the early uh, 2000s. And one of them was very interested in asking, do these diseases exist in Asia? And so they took Korean uh, serum from febrile patients there, and they tested them, and they found that 1.8% of these 491 serum from Korean patients who had fever, had antibodies against antiplasmic backstopping. And one of these patients in the serum actually had DNA for anaplasmic organisms in it as well. So this was the first evidence this infection really occurred in Asia. This was in Korea. Subsequently, the same, uh, the same individuals from my lab, Jin Ho Park and uh, Jung Sung Choi, went back and actually definitively showed that the antibodies in these patients' blood reacted to specific proteins from the organism anaplasm effects up, solidifying the fact that there was an infection in Korea by this organism, the first demonstration of this disease in Asia. Now this brings us to the case that we talked about earlier. This is a little more detailed. Our 50-year-old woman who had this sudden onset of high fever became very sick, began bleeding, uh, had the diagnosis of hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, uh, was continued on antivirals that should treat this began to get worse. And of course, she started in Guangdai County, which is right here, which is right here in Anhui province, which is right here in China. So on November 4th, she got worse. She was transferred to a hospital where she continued to bleed from her nose and her mouth. She had purpura, which is bleeding into the skin out of lobotomy sites. Her blood pressure dropped, and her oxygen saturation dropped in her blood, so she wasn't oxygenated very well. She was taken into the intensive care unit where she had respiratory and other supportive care. She continued to bleed from her mouth. She bled around the working area. All health care workers, family members would come in and help, and they would wipe the blood from the patient's nose and mouth, and they would rinse and reuse these cloths for wiping away the blood. And they weren't wearing gloves, by the way. On November 4th at 7.38 p.m., she became rapidly or progressively dyspneic, very difficult time breathing, and her oxygen desaturated. Uh, she was intubated, and there was a lot of blood contaminated field at that point, and the health worker, healthcare workers. By the next morning, she was abundant. She was hypoxic. Her blood pressure was very low. She had multi-organ failure. All of her organs began to fail. She could continue to bleed from her nose and her mouth, and then she died later that morning. So this is the index case, okay? So their final diagnosis was still hemorrhagic fever, fever with renal syndrome, but there were no antibodies against this virus when she died. They didn't do a post-mortem autopsy, and they didn't actually save any blood or tissue for retrospective laboratory testing. They just said, this is the diagnosis. 
However, when they went back and started talking with the family sometime later, they admitted that she had had a tick bite 12 days before the onset of fever, and she killed several mice in her home nine days before uh, the onset of the disease, and her husband had brought home wild animal carcasses three days before the onset of the illness. And so this is the timeline for all these things there. You can see her death occurred about seven days after the onset. So in order to be able to evaluate this, they did a bunch of tests at the time, and all of these tests were negative at the time. Tests for a variety of different viruses, rickettsia, SARS, many other viruses look antibodies. All of these tests were negative on this patient, so no one knew precisely what she had. And there was really no other support, supportive evidence that she actually had this hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. Well, what happened next was that within several days after that, about two weeks, well, a week to two weeks later, some other people began to become sick, particularly those that took care of this patient in the hospital. So you can see, here's the healthcare workers in gray, and in the dark color, family members also became ill, okay? And this is the relationship timeline here. So all nine of these patients actually were in Edishan Hospital, where this patient was actually being taken care of. They all developed fever. Five developed muscle aches, seven, seven developed diarrhea. All of them had low white blood cell counts. Most of them had low, uh, low platelet counts. Most of them had increases in their hepatic transaminases. Disease that looks like human granulocytic anaplasmosis. They did not do blood smear evaluations on many. And all these patients were linked by direct contact to the index patient at the time she was critically ill. This included five family members, two doctors, and two nurses. And here's an example of one of these doctors that actually was admitted to the hospital because he was so ill. Subsequently, they went back and they looked at these patients after they had recovered, three to eight weeks later, and they noticed that most of them had serum conversions. That is, they developed antibodies against anaplasma, phagus, atoplum, and here is the serum conversion data here concluding that most of these patients probably did have anaplasma bag stop infection. Then they went back and took blood from the acute phase of these patients' illness, and they were able to amplify anaplasma DNA from the blood of most of these patients as well, really solidifying the fact that these patients all had anaplasma bag stop infection, yet none of them had evidence of a tick point. So this really brought up a, a considerable controversy because this disease has never been known to be transmitted by anything but tick bite, yet it looked like a nose of comulacrity. That is an outbreak related to exposure in the hospital. So this is that timeline again. And if we expand that, we can look at this in this way. So here we have the period of, of time of hospitalization, the period of, of hemorrhage, hemorrhage and death there. And these are all the people that were exposed, the family members, the ones that are darkly colored here are the ones that became ill. And then here's the regional health care workers, the ones that did not become ill and the ones that did become ill. And what you can easily see is that only those that were exposed in this interval of time became ill. Others did not. And implying that perhaps there was something particular about this time when all the hemorrhage was going on that led to this exposure. And in fact, a good, strong epidemiologic uh, surveillance of this showed us that those individuals that were very close to the patient or had a long exposure to the patient were much more significantly likely to have the infection. Those individuals that had any direct blood contact or had direct respiratory or tracheal secretion contact were also significantly more likely to get the infection. Those individuals that had any direct blood contact on their skin were very likely to have acquired the infection, uh, as were those that were exposed to open wounds or abrasions where their relative risk was three to fourfold higher, or those that actually had direct respiratory or tracheal secretions on their skin, again, significantly higher, or those that had exposure to open wounds or abrasions with a relative risk three times higher than the others. So it looked like close exposure to blood or respiratory secretions probably the likely culprit for transmission here, kind of an unprecedented way to transmit this organism. So over this period of time, there were nine confirmed infections in this hospital, uh, and they were all confirmed by detection of DNA in the blood. All of them had antibody, seroconversions for most of these, uh, I rather seroconversions for all of them, and fourfold antibody increases for seven of them. The, the cluster was not tick-borne, 
it seemed to be related to exposure to blood or respiratory secretions. And the index patient was really only possible to uh, be characterized as a possible case because no final diagnosis was actually established there. But these are the kind of data that supports the possibility that she was an index case. She had a recent tick bite. She had a compatible incubation period with this disease, which is seven to ten days. She had a compatible clinical presentation that has been described for severe HGF, like the first patient I told you about. And the epidemiologic investigation implicates her as the index case. So this is the emergence of anaplasma in China. Well, what do we know about anaplasma in Asia and China at this point? Well, some other data shows that about 4 to 5 percent of exodes personal cases ticked. I mean, eight different studies carry this organism in the, in the tick. So these can actually bite people and transmit it to people. The rodents, which are the reservoirs and the host for these ticks, also have evidence of infection. 9% and 24% of field mice in China and Korea have evidence of infection. 64% of the shrews in Korea have evidence of infection. So this is naturally cycling through this. It's in the nature in Korea and parts of China. There were no prior proven cases in China, however, although there was one study that actually described antibody DNA in the blood of four Chinese patients after tick bites. Uh, I'm sorry, this was in Chinese, I couldn't read this. So. Uh, another epidemiologic study in Eastern Asia showed that about 2 to 9 percent of febrile patients have antibodies uh, to anaplasma, and among healthy Chinese residents, about a half percent to 6 percent in some geographic areas have antibodies. So that there is ongoing exposure to this organism in Asia. What do we know about the transmission and why this is so unusual? Well, that 75 percent of patients know from the United States studies, report a tick bite or tick exposure. So this is the way it's usually transmitted. There are some suggestions about alternatives for transmission. For instance, we've reported at least several individuals who seem to have acquired infection directly after exposure to blood from carcasses of deer that they butchered uh, in, in, in the United States. So direct exposure has been reported. There's been exposures through transfusion-related anaplasma infection transplacental transmission in a pregnant mother to her fetus. For other rickettes infections, transmission is well recognized through aerosols or direct contact, or mechanical transmission by fomites, like sharp instruments and things like that. And other relevant uh, observations for this particular study is that the blood burden, the amount of anaplasm increases as immune suppression goes on. This patient was treated with steroids as part of her course of therapy, and had counts perhaps as high as two 2.7 uh, to 5.9 times 10 to the 9 per liter. That's a lot of bacteria in blood. All the family members and health uh, that were and healthcare workers that, that were uh, infected contacted the blood. Both family members and healthcare workers were unlikely to use gloves. This is kind of interesting in a country where SARS occurred, but they were much more likely to wear masks than they were to wear gloves. And post-exposure precautions like hand and skin washing were not really stringently applied. So some of the normal things that we would do in the United States were not applied in this particular case there. So this is the, the, the outcome of this. Uh, uh, I spent a fair amount of time in China trying to work with my Chinese colleagues to figure this out. And we published this in, in JAMA in 2008 as the first described cases of nosocomial transmission of human granitic anaplasmosis and the first cases of human granitic anaplasmosis in China. And to my surprise, in the same edition, my two great, my two close friends and colleagues, Peter Krauss and Gary Worms, who are also colleagues in the world of tick-borne diseases, wrote an editorial where they said the report also should stimulate further investigation of the existence of anaplasma backstop in the region of China where this outbreak originated. In addition, it's essential to emphasize that fulfilling the case definition of HDA used for epidemiologic surveillance in the United States does not provide diagnostic certainty unless the diagnosis was established by the microbiological gold standard of culturing of microbes, which we did not. Therefore, the finding of the study by Zhang et al., while interesting and productive, provocative, should be regarded as preliminary. So I think the proper title for this is not nosocomial transmission of human granitic anaplasmosis, but nosocomial transmission of human granitic anaplasmosis with a question mark. Subsequently, we've done some additional studies. This is one that was done on farm workers in Tianjin, in nearby where the outbreak was, and you can see overall serologic evidence of infection, 8.8% of the population. 
subsequent <laughs> that, an investigation done by Li Zhuangzhang, the primary author of the paper that we wrote together, looked at individuals, 26 blood samples from febrile uh, patients who were suspected to have anaphasmosis in, in, in Yuan uh, County in Shandong. Uh, eight confirmed cases, two by PCR, two through seroconversion, and another six probable cases, individuals who had high antibody titers, and 48 blood samples from healthy people there, from healthy farmers, 26% had evidence of infection at some time or another. So it's looking likely that it really is there. Here's another report uh, by a Chinese group, including one of my American colleagues, Zhui uh, Zhejun, uh, uh, and what they found was very similar, high seroprevalence in many different counties throughout China. So anaphasmic is in China. And I want you to pay attention to this name because this is where the story starts to divert a little bit. So in mid-March to mid-July of 2009 in the rural areas of Hubei and Hainan provinces, uh, there were a large number of people that developed this severe fever with bronchocytopenia, leukopenia, gastrointestinal symptoms, and an, and an unusually high case fatality rate, which 30% of these individuals died. In June of 2009, uh, 2009, they began an investigation because they suspected this was anaphasma phagostopin or perhaps other pathogens and needed PCR and serology to try to prove it. Unfortunately, among this cohort, almost none of them had DNA or antibodies against anaphasma. And uh, they, so they went on thinking that this was something else. Since there was no cause known at this point, they actually made a case definition that was severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome, or FFTS. So this is where these cases were occurring in China, and they began to investigate broadly across there to figure out what was going on there. And here's what they found among 81 individuals that had this fever, anorexia, fatigue, nausea, uh, abdominal pain, tenderness. Well, these things are not too dissimilar to what we see with most of these nonspecific febrile illnesses. The headache and uh, confusion and myalgia seem to be a little bit less, but it's very, very similar. It would be very difficult to be certain these patients didn't have antibodies infection. And even among the deaths and distribution of these clinical findings, it's very, very similar. But what's different about this case is they broadened the investigation and actually recovered a novel virus that had never been described before. This is the cytopathic effect in, in viral culture. This is an indirect fluorescent antibody using an antibody that they might immunize in rabbits with the virus that they isolated from these patients. And here's some you know, electron micrographs showing the virus growing in cell culture. And when they went back, they actually proved by doing reverse transcriptase PCR on the acute phase samples from these patients that, in fact, this was a novel virus. They sequenced the entire genome of 11 different strains of this virus and showed that it was related to other flevoviruses uh, which are also in the group that are related to Kunitoro virus, sandfly fever viruses, Bukunini virus, Rift Valley fever virus, other sandfly fever viruses, and here is the severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome it's in each one of these groups in its own distinct way altogether. A novel virus, not ever before described, causes a syndrome that is almost an exact mimic of human granulocytic anaphasmosis. And so this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year. Uh, and you can see the first author is my friend, Shui uh, Jiu. Well, subsequent to that, another group in China published their data on exactly the same virus, an unknown virus isolated from the blood of two patients from hemophysalid ticks collected from dogs. Whole genome sequence analysis identified the virus as a novel member of the family of Umiviridae related to the genus Flevovirus, the same virus isolated by a second group. And in fact, this is a group that I've been working with in Henan province, where they've actually are uh, in the process of having a paper published that took a different approach that I want to talk about. This is the metagenomic analysis of their syndrome, which is called fever thrombocytopenia and leukopenia syndrome, essentially the same thing in Henan. And what they found was that most of these patients had fever thrombocytopenia and leukopenia syndrome. In 2007, most patients reported tick bites, but only 8% had anaphasma. But 8% did have anaphasma phagostop infection. So they used a method which was based upon a genomic approach to actually show that the, to discover the microbes in there. What they did was they extracted all the nucleic acids from the serum of 10 patients that were highly suspected to have this novel infection. And they sequenced everything. And they compared this to the sequences 
from serum from patients who did not have this infection, so they can actually remove everything that was not unique to the FTLS patients. And what was left behind was bunyavirus nucleic acids. And they showed that this, in fact, was exactly the same virus related to the flebovirus genus that Shai Yu and the other Chinese group also showed. They went back and they could do acute phase serum samples, showed that they all contained viral RNA, or most of them contained viral RNA. Most of them actually had serologic reactions, 52 serum conversions, and 21 with fourfold increases in antibody titers. And they actually isolated the virus from four of the six acute phase patients. So three different groups now actually working on the same virus discovered all within a very short period of time, each using a different mechanism for uh, discovering the virus. This actually caused a lot of problems in China because there's a lot of competition among scientists there, which I think is kind of sad. In fact, uh, this is a report out of science uh, from the end of last year, about a year ago now, where rival teams identify a virus uh, behind a desk in central China. Uh, the, the, the unfortunate outcome of this was that in the process, you allow me to do this, in the process of creating an author list, I've never understood how so many authors would be on a single publication. Apparently one person was ignored who made significant contributions, and this uh, Chinese scientist killed himself over this. Uh, it's a very, very, very sad and dramatic outcome uh, because these kinds of things, these teams need to get together to work together, not to be competitive like this, I believe. But it's getting bigger. So this is something I just pulled off the internet yesterday. Is China's anaplasmosis the next is China's anaplasmosis the next Lyme disease? For those of you that don't know what's going on in the United States, Lyme disease is a, a real curse. It's a real curse there. Not because it's such a big problem, it's a very political problem more than anything else. Uh, plus, I like the picture of the tick here. But if you read through this article, this is perhaps the most interesting thing out of this article. According to Daily Finance, stocks of Chinese drug makers rose to a four months high recently after that reports that a tick-borne disease, human granicidic anaplasmosis, has claimed 18 lives in Chinese, China's central Henan province. Uh, isn't that great? People will figure out a way to make money off of almost anything in money. In fact, you can now buy a book. You see? Anaplasmosis. Global status. And it's only $39.99 American dollars. So life's wonderful. Wherever you go. So, I'm going to conclude by talking about one last thing to try to tie all this up. Why is all this important? Why is it important to pay attention to new findings, to always ask the next question when it doesn't quite make sense, like Zhui Xu Yu did? He didn't believe that those infections in China were anaplasmosis. I thought they were. I published a paper. He went to the next level to prove that it was something different and actually made a new discovery that really will likely have a very big impact in China because now they'll be able to address the disease they didn't know existed. So, let's change this topic a little bit to uh, the work of one of my students. Actually, this is one of my junior faculty members at Hopkins, Megan Reller, who's an infectious disease physician, who's also a microbiologist, uh, who took advantage of uh, a situation that happened a couple years ago with the tsunamis. Uh, and there was some money available to study febrile disease that occurred after the tsunamis. And in this case, we were looking at southern Sri Lanka, where there was a lot of problems. So she set up a study to look at consecutive cases of febrile disease in southern Sri Lanka. And she looked at 1,200 consecutive febrile patients in Sri Lanka, and rolled them into the study, followed them very closely, and got follow-up on about 800 to 900 of these patients so that we can actually do very, very careful etiologic diagnosis that is established what caused the fever in each one of these individuals. Now, we have a bias toward vector-borne diseases and zoonotic diseases, and that's what we're mostly interested in. But what she did was actually really extraordinary. At the outset, she actually brought blood culture in to really make an etiologic diagnosis. Because in southern Sri Lanka, if you get fever, you have typhoid fever until proven otherwise. In fact, you're treated for typhoid fever. Well, in this particular case, she showed that only 11 out of uh, almost 1,100 individuals that were enrolled had bacteremia, and none of them had typhoid fever. Not one person in this cohort had typhoid fever. None of them had HIV. So what did they have? Well, careful analysis showed on almost 900 people for which we had uh, paired serum, we could do careful analysis, that 
had leptose, uh, rather 13 and a half percent had leptosporosis. About 6% had dengue. About 17, almost 18% had all, all overall had any rickettsial infection. This comprises scrub type with spotted fever group rickettsia, type group rickettsia, or where we can't tell what rickettsia is. About 1% to 2% had Q fever. And what's interesting to me about this is that about 23% of these cases of leptospirosis were suspected to be leptospirosis. So physicians aren't doing a real good job of identifying leptospirosis. 14% of the cases that turned out to be dengue were suspected to be dengue. Not a single physician suspected one of these being a rickettsial infection and got it right. In fact, out of the entire cohort, only two physicians expected that any of these 1,000 patients had scrub typhus. So they were completely wrong about their diagnosis, which means that we have to have better tools to be able to do this. And in order to be able to make discoveries, we have to start to study large numbers, large numbers of patients, big populations, because you can see, we don't have a lot of patients with scrub typhus. We don't have a lot of spotted fever with rickettsiosis. If we want to study these properly, we need to have large numbers. So this is my idea. We need to be able to work together, unlike what happened in China. Okay? We need to pool our resources. We need to actually say, look, I've got 10 patients, you've got 10 patients, let's bring together and make a good study out of this. To do that, you also have to have the proper tools to be able to do this study. So as a microbiologist, one of the things we've been working on are diagnostic tests that can be applicable to 1,000 patients at a time, or 2,000 patients at a time. And we can do this by doing multiplex PCR methods. PCR methods are simply methods for amplifying the And so this is one of the things that we've been working on in the laboratory, where in a single one microliter sample of DNA from the blood of a patient, we can co-amplify rickettsia, anaplasma, rickettsia, the spotted fever group rickettsia. We can amplify ehrlichia. We can amplify orient susukamushi. We can extend that. We can detect four different species of plasmodium in that same one microliter of DNA. Or we can detect at the same time Falciparum malaria, biovax malaria, or relapsing fever brevia. And this is just the beginning. We can do all of these things. And we can make these very, very broad, broad scale, large scale diagnostic studies that will help us understand the etiology of febrile disease, the etiology of infectious disease, and really begin to hone in on where the problems are and how we can address them better. So, with that, I'm going to stop. I think that's my last slide altogether. Oh, other than to tell you, the Chinese people love you all, and they say hi. This is a great country if you've never been there to visit. Uh, they're wonderful people. And these were a couple of people, Eji Shan Hostel, that took care of those uh, nine patients that got sick after that index case. So with that, I'm going to stop. And if there's time, I'll be happy to address any questions that anyone has, or if you want to have a discussion about anything, even similar to this, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for your attention. Is there any, does the virology of the carpocytopenia, um, the, um, the RT, the, uh, why is that produced in illness that looks like anaplasmosis? Uh, really, no one knows the answer to that because it's Especially only been discovered. Yeah, we, the, the host cell is not known. Uh, they don't know what tick transmits this. Uh, there's almost nothing known about this brand new virus. I suspect with the resources that China has and how how, how bad this disease is uh, in, in China, that the, the they're going to make a big push toward trying to figure this out very, very rapidly. I mean, this is a 30% fatality rate. That's a very, very bad disease. Uh, I think it's a well, it's hush hush. Um, the, the answer is not definitively. However, I was at CDC um, several months ago for a peer review committee, and I was discussing some of these findings in China with my colleague there, and they have told me that they've actually identified a, a new flebovirus in the United States that looks like it's causing an infection too, but I haven't seen any data on it at all. So it's likely that these things are actually spread around the world already. We just have never been able to discern them from other kinds of infections. I think one of the things I didn't point out here is if you count up the proportion, let me just go back here. If you count up the proportion of diagnoses that you actually get through a study like this, it's, yeah, it's not even 40%. So what's the rest of the 60%? I mean, that's where our jobs are. And that's where your jobs will be as you 
begin to go out there and take care of patients, always maintain that level of curiosity as what's going on here, and it will serve you well in your career. The, um, the, the hallmark telegram that are most the deaths from hematic complications or respiratory failure? It's my understanding that most of them are actually from rather hemorrhagic complications. But most of those patients that die, I, mean, I think there was a slide here that addressed that, but I think most of them have very significant uh, hemorrhage and hypertension, so it's believed that it's mostly hemorrhage and then the hypertensive manifestations of the most organ donor. So, so GI hemorrhage, someone is dangling? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. What's striking about this is Well, it's possible. And in fact, if, if you read carefully through the things that, to, uh, you know, you don't put these things in the primary publication very often, but if you read the editorials that accompany this, where they actually interviewed uh, my friend, the Zui Zhi Yu, who made this discovery, uh, he thought all along was unlikely to be, and his main explanation was that GI symptoms are just not that prevalent with anaplasm infection, but it was actually a, a significant manifestation in this particular group. I, I, I find it hard to kind of make too much out of that, but you know, he was convinced about it. It seems to be holding her way. Right. Yes? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Prophylaxis. Prophylaxis. So, yeah, so I mean, we talked about uh, at, at least two different diseases today. Uh, I'll address human anaplasma, uh, anaplasma phagostomic infection. Um, and no one knows the answer to that. Uh, we have seen uh, some evidence that if you have a tick bite and you take antibiotics, it may prevent diseases like Lyme disease, but those studies have never been done for rickettsial infections. The, the, uh, the, the classic saying among the experts of rickettsia is that it should be contraindicated because it simply delays the growth of organisms. These drugs are not cyclic, they do not kill the microorganisms, they simply are static and they delay their growth. And part of the recovery process for many of these infections is adequate stimulation of immunity so that your immune system can clear the microorganism. But to be honest with you, I've never seen the supportive evidence for that in the literature and that's the thing. For the, the new virus, for this new fleet of virus, the new bunch of virus, uh, there's almost nothing known about how you can prophylax that. Clearly the ribavirin they used in those early cases didn't seem to make any difference with this virus at all. Uh, so I suspect this will be another thing that China's going to be diligently looking at over the next couple of years. One of those slides in the triangle. Uh, I'm not certain if you did or not. I have to go back and read through it. Yeah, I think that's the one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y